first of all, let's realize why they're coming. It's a totally different life. You're just surviving. There's no space for anything else. So anybody who's here that is, uh, you know, second, third, fourth generation that has a little bit more, feel blessed. But it's up to people to guide us to get to that next level. I think I got we are very, very lucky with Beth. Not everybody has that. And by the way, the duration of that, we didn't talk about that, but that was a four year kindness effort. Four years. Like I didn't feel comfortable at the beginning working in that office. I felt actually uncomfortable. My people were in the back of the warehouse. My mom was in the back of the warehouse. And there I am in the front of the office. I felt a little guilty, to tell you the truth. But it takes people like a, a like a Beth to make you feel better about that. She would have a holiday parties and invite the entire company, not just the people in the front. I didn't feel like I didn't fit in because I've been fitting in to this office world. Hey, Clever Habits Tribe, it's Gabby V back for season six, episode two. And today we're with Martha Nino, a Mexicana who is living in Silicon Valley in tech. That's something you don't hear every day. Hey, Martha, how are you? Thanks for coming. Hey, Gabby, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Let's do this. Yeah, I'm really excited because we've been doing a lot of collabs already through Convoy OP and then some other things that we've been doing with your podcast. So now we get to hear a little bit about you and your story. It's, it's crazy. People are talking about, yeah, Silicon Valley, blah, blah, blah. But we mostly just think bros and hoodies. So let's talk about the other people that are over there. I'm a hoodie then. <laughs> no bros and hoodies here. <laughs> yeah, no bros and hoodies. Just chicas in, in faldas, that's it. You've been living in Silicon Valley before it was Silicon Valley. It was, it's actually Santa Clara Valley. So tell us something about the people who, the normal, quote unquote, people who live there. But yes, I've been there um, most most of my life. The Silicon Valley was nothing like you see on the news or TV or, you know, it was fields of produce and flowers. I remember gladiola, like big gladiola flower fields everywhere and factories, lots of factories. And that was about it. Maybe one or two big, large um, Silicon Valley companies like HP and things like that. Um, but Aside from that, there wasn't much here. And uh, as I was growing up, things started popping up. I, I used to go to the flea market, a large San Jose flea market, most Sundays of my life when I was a child. And I went there this weekend because it's shutting down. And it was kind of sad because it was part of my childhood. Three quarters of the flea market now gone. And around it, a bunch of apartments that look like Legos. Beautiful memories that I had are gone. Also, the gladiola fields that I mentioned earlier gone you know the cherry orchards and apricot orchards the trees gone and filled with buildings so it's good and it's bad you know it's like okay we're bringing in some economy but you're losing some of the life that was there before you are a tica from mexico that came as an undocumented immigrant and worked your way up so let's start way back at the beginning what part of mexico are you from Okay, so I'm from the center part of Mexico, a place called Zacatecas. I don't know if any of your people have heard of it, but it's a big state in the middle. You know, there's many people who are very well off in Mexico, but there's also many people who are not. I'm the are not. I'm from a little town um, called Pueblo Viejo, old town. No running water, no electricity. And that was kind of generations of that in my family. And so my parents met and worked in cotton fields, in other fields too, but there was no real life or future for us. And they decided they needed to take a risk. The risk to get to this country was, you know, is one that can lead to something good or not lead to anything at all. It's very dangerous because, you know, we're not wanted here. Right. My husband is also a refugee and he even some of the stories, he's like, I can't tell you that yet because I don't feel like talking about it. But I had him on a few seasons ago. He made the trek from his country in East Africa, went through the Sahara, crossed the Mediterranean in like a little rubber dinghy thing. So it's it's difficult. And I just got chills when you said that. And I'm glad you're bringing that up because 
you know, a lot of people did not want me to talk about my story, including my mother. So when I spoke about my story, my mom's like, are, are you going to say everything? And I was like, w why would I like I've I've done all right in the valley. You know, I've done all right in my life and I'm at a point where I'm safe. I've earned my, a little money. I've gotten I have a career. Uh, I have documents and I feel safe with the people around me meaning that I don't feel judged. And if I, if I am judged, I don't care. So I think that it's very, very important to feel safe. And so I feel my mom in telling me that she still had trauma from speaking the story. So it takes a lot of work to get through that trauma. And actually, by us talking about it, maybe another person who's gone through something similar might feel a little bit more healed because they, you know, somebody have has overcome and they were accepted and they were accepted, which means that maybe there's hope that my story is not a bad one. Maybe we just need to know that we can get through trauma. We can get through bad stuff. We can get through stuff that supposedly is embarrassing and shameful. That needs to be shouted from the rooftop so that people like your husband, people like Koi from Convoy OP, you know, we all just know that where we come from is only that it's where we come from. It doesn't mean that's where we need to end up because we felt so bad about being from the bottom for so long. It, it definitely has taken a toll on up here. And if we don't talk about how we overcame that, guess what? We don't have a blueprint then. Even as jaggedy as it might be, it's something. It's a hope plan. We need to speak about that. So I hope that with this story, people can get an idea of how a hope plan can start and it starts with one wanting to be better and then two having a guide or somebody to tell you this is how you can potentially start we ended up in not in southern california a lot of latinas were going to southern california at the time but because my grandfather was in northern california that's how we ended up over here wherever the work is that's where we go so, and the whole idea is for to work, 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 work. Yeah. Let me stop you there, right there, Martha. This is like a whole odyssey that's happening. But what I see in most media, which is why we have clever hybrids, is we want to talk about the middle. People are like, yeah, this was the hard beginning. And now I'm here. I'm like, what about all the stuff in between? <laughs> that is such a good, I'm glad you stopped me because the stuff in between is so important. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You guys got here. You started working. You're undocumented, so you have to be very careful. Very and then, quiet. Very quiet. How did you manage that? I understand it now. I understand it now. So, um, yeah, that middle part is very hard. The parents are trying to do what it takes to stay in this country and earn a little bit more. I'm going to school, but school's not really a um, a place for us to elevate ourselves. It's actually a babysitter while your parents are working in the fields or working in the factories. I mean, my mom was only educated to sixth grade and my dad to second, okay? They didn't know, like, the value of education. Who's going to talk about college if they don't know about it? Who's going to talk about high school if they've never been there? You know, if they don't understand the educational system, Gabby. So I kind of went through life um, dreaming about working. And I started working at 10 years old. I did exactly what my, my parents wanted us to do in this country. And so at a very young age, I worked. And by the time I was 14, I was working at one of those factories with my mother. It was a ceramic company. These things that break, I broke everything, Gabby. But I'm a kid. I'm 14 years old. And, you know, the owner of the company, her name is Beth. She didn't fire me, honestly. She saw potential for me in the office. Changed my life. Because she opened the door to the office. Yeah, let's dig a little bit deeper into people like Beth, because I think in the last couple of years, we have these sitcoms, everything gets resolved in 30 minutes. And now we have the social media is like, oh, I gave this coffee to a homeless person. I'm so awesome, selfie. But it's more than just the one time stuff. What is it that Beth did for you over years to help you to develop yourself? Beth was amazing. And what she did was, she started little by little. She knew I didn't know anything about the office, but she knew I had potential. And she says, if you have any questions, ask me. 
and in a way that was very open. It wasn't judgy at all. So she was very welcoming. And also she said things like, do you have a typing class in school? And I said, yeah, you should take a typing class, you know, so you can help me do more things. And I was like, okay, so next semester I signed up for a typing class. So she started little by little guiding me, feeding me very, very small lessons of whatever job it was. And eventually it became a bigger thing. And the other thing that people like Beth did, Beth gave me a lot of encouragement, a lot of really good words. And by the way, we didn't talk about what Beth looked like. Beth had blue eyes, blonde hair, white pearls, looked like, you know, the fanciest woman on earth. Those people in the movies, that's what she looked like to me. It was the 80s. I had high hair, you know, lots of mascara and eyeliner. I look super scary. She cared about what I could do. And the more compliments that she gave me, the more pick me up she gave me and the more things I actually learned. And she said, wow, that was really good. I actually wanted to do more for her. I think that in my culture, culturally, we don't give people a lot of pick me ups, not many compliments. Without knowing it, Beth gave me those very specific kudos frequently. So I started doing a lot for Beth. I started learning a lot in the office to the point where all throughout my high school career, I I worked for her. But at school, because my parents hadn't pushed for anything school, I wasn't getting any compliments at school. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was actually failing my school. And the principal at the school says, you can't be here anymore. A lot of kids that looked like me ended up at continuation schools because they had the same upbringing as me. Continuation school, okay? This is where like supposedly the bad kids go. Supposedly I was a bad influence, supposedly. But he didn't know like everything that I was doing after school. He didn't ask. He didn't ask. Yeah, that's the other side of the spectrum. Beth was like the super encouraging and he's like, yeah, Chola, get out of my school. (laughs) We don't need your people here. Hey, that's exactly Gabby. You nailed it on the head. Nobody asked us why we were there and what what was happening like in our home life. You know, in my particular case, by that time, my father was dying of cancer. So I had to work even more. So I focused on the work. I didn't focus on the school. I'm a senior in high school and I need to graduate. And so the counselor at the school, at the continuation school, asked me why I was there. And in in true Chola style, I said, "Ah, you know, you know, I was so rebellious and I didn't want anybody to come into my world and ask me because I was embarrassed to talk about whatever I was living. He literally was patient and kept asking me, well, you know, what's going on? What's happening at home? What do you do after school? Like for like an hour. And he totally pressured me. Thank God for relentless, stubborn counselors like that because he finally got it out of me. So he was patient. There's that patience word again, right? What he did for me was he says, let's develop a plan for you to get out of here. So he literally like very specific said, you must do this. You must do that. You must do this by X8. Like be very specific with your plan. And then he said, you can get out of here and be done in four months and go back to that other high school where you were at. So big moment. The the challenge was I was working and I said, how am I going to do all of this if I'm working? So something had to give. He says, talk to your, your boss, your boss, Beth. I was scared to talk to her, to tell you the truth. I got the courage to uh, tell her the situation. I said, look, I, I really want to graduate high school, but it's going to require more, t- more of my time in the afternoon. Is there any way? So there was a backup plan. I always go to somebody with a solution. Okay. So I said, but what if I work you know, a little bit more. And she says, that's a great idea. Why don't you work more on the weekends? You'll double up on the weekends. That freed up my time so that I can focus on my studies for the next four months. You know, there was encouragement going on, those frequent good words, which I think there's studies out there that show, you know, the more frequent good words people get, the more you believe in them. Exactly. And you mentioned patience a few times. There was a quote that I heard a few days ago, and I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's What is the difference between being nice and being kind? Most people are very nice. They'll help you one time. But a kind person is patient enough like Beth, like that counselor, to help you make smart goals, to follow up, to be flexible, to give you encouragement. Then it helps you grow exponentially. (music) 
sometimes what happens, and I know, Martha, you are the complete opposite of this, but many people, they come as immigrants, they make it, but then the next generation behind them is coming. We have another refugee crisis coming up from Latin America to the U.S. right now. They're like, eh, those are those people. They pull up the ladder behind them. How can you, you balance? You got what you need to help somebody else get what they need now. First of all, let's realize why they're coming. It's a totally different life. You're just surviving. There's no space for anything else. So anybody who's here that is, uh, you know, second, third, fourth generation that has a little bit more, feel blessed. But it's up to people to guide us to get to that next level. I think I got very, very lucky with Beth, with that counselor. Not everybody has that. And by the way, the duration of that, we didn't talk about that. But that was a four-year kindness effort. Four years. Like, I didn't feel comfortable at the beginning working in that office. I felt actually uncomfortable. My people were in the back of the warehouse. My mom was in the back of the warehouse. And there I am in the front of the office. I felt a little guilty, to tell you the truth. Yeah, there's guilt. There's also like, I don't really belong here. What if I mess up? There's a lot of stuff going on when you're the only one somewhere. The only one in the first one. But it takes people like a, like a Beth to make you feel better about that. She would have uh, holiday parties and invite the entire company, not just the people in the front. I didn't feel like I didn't fit in because I've been fitting in to this office world. There, there's actually uh, a school down here that they go to school four days a week and they work one day a week in an office. I think that's genius. But they go work at these companies that they might not even be comfortable going in later. But because they're doing it at an age from 14 to 18, where they're actually developing, I actually think it makes a difference. That's what happened to me. I like that you're that we're actually seeing each other, Gabby, because people can see that I don't, you know, I don't have a suit jacket. I don't have, you know, a crispy white shirt. I'm just an ordinary person with a t-shirt and red hair, whatever it is. We don't all look like that stereotypical nerd that you see in like Silicon Valley. There are some of them and I love them to death. You just reminded me. So when I entered that sound company, again, it felt good, but I didn't know what careers were there. I mean, I was helping out in the office, okay? And my manager at the time, I've always had these amazing people. This guy was named Ken. Ken is Asian, okay? He looked nothing like me. I do a lot in a very short amount of time. I try to be friendly. That's what my mom taught me to do. You do whatever they tell you. and You ask them to do more, right? And so he can see that in me. He sat me down and he says, Martha, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, kind of thing. I don't know. You know, <laughs> my mom's over here picking cherries, you know, from the fields and my dad's pouring cement. But he says, Martha, here's, here's some options. Okay. You're very good at the office work. That's great. Do you want to continue on that path? If you want to continue on the path you're on, there's two or three steps, right? You can become an executive admin. That's great. Some people make a good living doing that. You can come over here this route and get specialized in an area. Being very, very specific has helped me my whole life in those plans. You know, I don't know what I don't know. I need to learn from these amazing, smart people with hoodies and, you know, bros and tech to teach me what I don't know. But they also need to see it in me. Because sometimes we just leave it at that. It's like, you'll get it. And I'm like, hmm, what does she mean by you'll get it? And we just go on our merry way for years, right? It kind of goes two ways, but we need to be not shy about asking. Yeah, definitely. But now let's go into where you are now, Martha. You've been working for Adobe for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Your husband was also in tech, and now he's chosen to go on out on his own doing mm -hmm. Maserati parts, which was pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You're both Latinos, but you both have separate cultures. You're Mexicana, he's Colombiano, and now you have two American teenagers. How's that going? <laughs> His was a little tougher because he came here when he was 20-something years old. You're the one having to survive. You don't have parents. He was working the, the drive through at the time. The drive through was like torture for him because he had to speak. He had to literally use his voice. And so what he would do is memorize the menu 
we like met, just literally memorize the menu. And when he heard it, he would press the, okay, they want a Whopper, okay, Whopper. You know, they want, you know, fries, okay, fries. Depending on when, when you come to this country, there's different experiences. In, in one year, he learned English and he ended up in a warehouse in tech. He also was a very hard worker and other people saw things in him. And so he did all right. Eventually he retired, semi-retired, I guess, and started the sports car in the sports car industry. So my kids have actually seen both of us and they know our stories, you know, from the ground up. So hopefully it's an example for them to say, okay, even though you're here, you can actually be here. You just need to work hard. Anyways, we're, we're divorced now, but we're trying to raise two amazing girls and uh, it's a partnership. But yeah, the struggle was very similar. And again, just different stages of our, our lives. But I empathize with, with all immigrants. And then I had my mom who was a different story, right? And by the way, there's immigrants that come to this country that come with education and come with money. I think that's awesome. Yeah, in the end, it's just mindset. If, if you are coming from a background of privilege, so to speak, then sometimes you have more trouble adapting. You're, you're coming from like being on top to now you're at the bottom and your English is not so good and you don't have the humility to talk and get better. If you're like, I got no other option, I'm just going to say stuff until it comes out right. Totally different, <laughs> totally different world. You know, I know we're talking about immigrants here, but let's nip it in the bud. Let's make them not want to come to the United States. People from Mexico. So you know how I told you my grandfather would send money to my, my grandma? Well, guess what? My aunts, my mom has five sisters. Uh, my aunts never had to come to the United States because with that little janitorial money that he earned, he was able to send back. And guess what? They were able to get their education in a third world country. They became teachers. They're amazing. They didn't have to risk everything to come to this country because they were able to stay there and live their lives with their families. Like, how awesome is that? I think there's a happy medium here that if you don't want them here, well, let's help them stay there. There's something to be done about immigration and education and I think they need to go hand in hand and I know that's a big old thing but I dream big Gabby the middle like you say there's a lot to be learned about the middle that nobody talks about yeah just the middle in general has been ignored across so many levels the middle class the middle size of company just being like in the middle of a transition most people are like I was here and I'm here being in the middle is okay being in the, I love that. I love that you just say that. Being in the middle is okay. And talking about the middle is okay. Let's take the taboo about talking about the middle. And by the way, let's document it, which is what you're doing. And I think it's fantastic. There have been a lot of tech layoffs recently. Mm -hmm. And as you've been talking about, there are many immigrants that are working in tech, that maybe some of their salary is remittance is back home. So where do you think that situation is going to go? Yeah, that's that's tough, you know, and I hope that some of the folks that are working in these tech, tech companies, you know, have saving. I mean, that's a tough thing when you're losing your job, right? Because it affects the it, it, the supply. Some people supply, like you said, to their parents, to their grandparents, to extended family. And, and that's, that's hard. You got to be a hustler and not dwell on it too much. It sucks to lose your, your job and all of that. But this country has so many opportunities. Let's be humble and maybe take on some of the jobs, even if it's just temporary, that other people might not want right now. A job is a job. Just because you work in tech doesn't mean you have to keep working in tech. I mean, honestly, here in California, there's been a lot of tech layoffs, but there's also a lot of help wanted signs. Okay, so what's wrong with that picture? We just want the job that pays the most. I get it. But there's also other opportunities around that. And yes, it might be tough for interim, but we're in a country where there's a lot of opportunities. We need to be adaptable. You know, I remember when I got laid off from one job before Adobe, I was five months pregnant, five months pregnant. I can't even go apply for a job on five months pregnant. What do I do? You adapt? All I'm saying is there is opportunity here in California. Yes, there's been tech layoffs, but there's also people hiring. It might be harder to get in, but we have to stop dwelling and just hustle. 
and for those of our listeners, I know most of you are in the U.S., but some of you are listening from Colombia and Mexico. Hola, Colombia, <laughs> yeah. And even though we're talking about the U.S., this applies to you too. With the internet in your hometown, you can figure out a way to make money on the internet. You can figure out a way to do offshoring. You have a lot more options than you did even 10 years ago. So don't give up, you guys. Don't give up, guys. Yeah. And there's a lot of digital ways to make money. I mean, I think with the pandemic, Gabby, like, for instance, you could do design work. You can do audio work. Um, I use a company called Fiverr every now and and then. Um, So there's a lot of different ways to get money. We just need to kind of turn those rocks and see what's out there. As a wrap up here, Martha, what would you say is where you're going? You have your book coming out the other side that talks a little bit more about your story. And I really like how you said you've written it. It's different stories from the perspective of a child at the different ages. So that will be very interesting. It's coming out in December 2022. Yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes, you guys. But if anyone wants to get in touch with you for more info, Martha, where can they reach you where they where can they follow you buy things that you made okay so first of all you ask where i'm going i have no idea (laughs) let me just be honest i work for adobe and i do you know some side speaking and and writing i've I've been writing a lot and uh it's interesting i've been writing for three years and little short stories on linkedin and so follow me on linkedin martha nino i've written so much that it's now i just had enough content to write a book And honestly, it's kind of relevant to what you're talking about. It's a lot of stuff from the middle. It's a lot of stuff from the middle. So I don't even talk about it probably in like last 20 years. It was a lot of what I grew up with, what we went through, uh, what our life was, some silly stories, some funny stories, some just, you know, reflections. Anyways, enjoy the book. It's called The Other Side, From a Shack to Silicon Valley. And there's also going to be a Spanish version, El Otro Lado. I'm like, El Otro Lado. (laughs) That's what they call it. And that's what they call uh, the United States, El Otro Lado. So I thought it was a good title, El Otro Lado, The Other Side of the Story. You'll be able to find that on martanino.com. And there's a, a place there called Martha's Books or something. And yes, it's coming out in December, and I'm super excited about that. I translated it for um, for my mother and for others from Colombia, Mexico, Peru, whatever. Hola, people. And then if you just want to send me a direct message, uh, connect with Martha at gmail.com. I'm cool with that too. So that's what's happening. And who knows what will happen in the future. I mean, last year, I didn't know I'd be here talking to you, Gabby. So next year could be a whole different thing. And I think the whole theme for me and my future and what I've been through, if I look back, is just adaptability to whatever comes. And if it feels good, I'll just do it. Even if I don't know how to do it, I'll find amazing people that do, that can teach me. And we need to be humble enough to ask for help. That's it. And on that note, we will say thank you to everyone for listening. This was an amazing conversation with you, Martha. I really appreciate it. This is Gabby V for the Clever Hybrids Bilingual Life Podcast, and we'll see you in the next one.